As you are able, would you please stand for the reading and hearing of God's word today? Today's scripture lesson is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again? Then they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women who were with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloth by themselves. Then he went home amazed at what had happened. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. I was given a new script this morning. It says the Easter Bunny is so happy to have put eggs in the pews and other seats, but he could not put one in every seat. Happy Easter, and remember, Jesus loves you, and so do I. So there we go. If someone wants the golden egg, I'll put it on the altar and you can come get it along with the body and blood of Jesus Christ. What a beautiful Easter for so many reasons, not the least of which is that on this Easter day, a team from our state of North Carolina will win a pretty significant basketball game, right? Yes. I understand that not everyone shares my um, <laughs> relative neutrality in that. I was 10 when I lost my first grandparent, my dad's father, otherwise known as Granddaddy. He was funny and tender. We all loved being around him, and he loved being around us, his three children, uh, their spouses, and four young grandchildren. Even though when we would get too loud, he would turn his hearing aids down and then he would laugh by saying, when we wanted to say something to him and he would say, why'd you say I can't hear you? I turned my hearing aids down, y'all got too loud. He loved it when we all came to visit, but his, part of his love language was to say things like, boy, I sure am glad you're here. Now we can quit getting ready for you. <laughs> the dyes are great storytellers. And several of them are real characters. And so the gatherings in those days before and during the funeral were really wonderful, full of laughter through our tears, all the way to the grave. After the burial, we lingered, telling more stories, laughing, crying. Our youngest grand, the youngest grandchild, my cousin four-year-old Eric, knew that everyone kept talking about granddaddy. But he knew that granddaddy wasn't there. Boldly, he interrupted all of the adults and said, where is granddaddy? One of the caring adults said, well, granddaddy died. His spirit will always be with us, but his body's in the grave. Boldly. Eric walked up to that grave. He stood on top of it, put his hands on his hips, and bent down and said, Granddaddy! Granddaddy, come out! To which we all laughed and cried 
again. When the women went to the tomb on Easter morning, it was not with the kind of boldness that Eric had, even though they had been told that Jesus would rise from the dead. They went with great love to anoint the body of someone who had died, showed tremendous honor and devotion. They went with love, but they expected death. The men in dazzling clothes ask, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but he is risen. The women had heard the words, the words that Jesus had told them about his life beyond death. But in the face of everything they had experienced in the past three days, these were the women that were at the foot of the cross. Everything they had seen, they still expected death because they couldn't yet believe that resurrection could be real and true in the midst of all that had happened. The dazzling men say to the women, Remember? Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified and on the third day rise again. They did remember. They had heard the words, but now they believed them. Because the stone was rolled away, they saw the empty tomb, life where they expected death. The empty tomb was to them and is to us a sign that resurrection life is there even when it seems that there is only death. This is a unique Easter at Millbrook because rather than the more familiar gospel stories immersing ourselves in the life and ministry of Jesus in the weeks leading up to Easter, we have been immersed in the Bible starting in Genesis. All Hebrew scriptures, some of them exquisite and inspiring like the crossing of the Red Sea, many of them also disturbing and difficult like the times that God's own people die in terrible ways because they they were disobedient to God. There's a lot of violence, and there's a lot of death. Some of you that have been following along in the Bible year, which is finishing 2 Kings right now, might feel a little relieved for this little entree into the Jesus stories, especially on Easter And the best way to know Jesus is to know his own scriptures, his people, his story, his world. And the Bible does contain one continuous message from beginning to end. It is the message of God's redemptive love that even in the face of death, there is life. How can we look for the light offered by our God of light, even where we see or expect death? One of the books that's helped me in particular in this Bible year is called What is the Bible? And it, author Rob Bell says that in the rabbinical tradition, they talk about scripture having 70 faces. So when you read it, you keep turning it like a gem letting the light refract through the various faces in new and unexpected ways. You keep turning the gem, seeing something new each time. The refraction of God's redemptive light and love is always available to us. Today, more than any other day, but yet it always is there for us, seeks us out, calls to us. We too can see life where we are expecting death. We too can be bold enough to look into a grave and believe that life will conquer death. When you read those really hard passages in the Bible, when you face loss or grief or 
being completely overwhelmed by a myriad of reasons in your own life. As you look around in the world where there is a lot of death, not only the death of violence and war, but the death of words that speak death instead of life and hate instead of love. The resurrection can help us turn the gem, to look again, to turn it and turn it until God's light shines through. We can look for life and light in the scriptures, in each other, in our own lives and in the world. And it's okay that we don't get it right the first time. The disciples didn't either, and they were right there. In fact, they didn't even believe once they saw the empty tomb. It can take time and wrestling to see things anew. When I was in divinity school, I took a class called Gender, Ethnicity, and Violence in the Old Testament, known by its popular name as light, happy topics, and easy reading. <laughs> we had a final project in which the professor encouraged us to pick a passage that we really struggled with. Maybe the one that made us cry. I picked Judges 19, certainly one of the most violent and terrible passages in the Bible. Some of us have read it recently. In it, a woman is raped and murdered, and her body cut up into 12 pieces and sent to the 12 tribes of Israel. Just the story you want to hear about on Easter morning, I know. Hang in there. These research papers take hours and hours over a number of weeks to write, and I really wrestled. I cried more than a few tears, trying to figure out where was there any light in this story. In particular, I remember one cold, rainy Thanksgiving weekend where after a short visit to my family, I spent the whole weekend immersed in this story. And it seemed like there was only death. But after turning the gym, and wrestling, and praying, and hearing other voices as if I were a midwife just helping something new to be born, I was able to emerge with a message of life even in the midst of death. The way that this woman's final act was one of resistance and courage and protest against the violence that she had experienced at the hands of those that were supposed to be the people of God. I couldn't get that until I wrestled. And I didn't get it all on my own. Even now, 17 years later, I'm still wrestling and I'm still learning. Some of you have many more years than I do of reading the Bible and wrestling with scripture. How do we read all those violent passages? in light of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. What is the Bible helped me here again? It says, Jesus went to his death on a cross without any violence himself. That's how Jesus reads those passages. He came not to keep violence in circulation, but to bring an end to it. And so the most violent books, like Judges, he never quotes them or mentions them. What does Jesus mention of his own scriptures? It's the Psalms and the prophets. The passages that are grapple real, in a real way that, yes, there is trouble, but proclaim the message of hope that God brings good news, peace, and redemption. Even in hard times, I know that many of you see the gem of God's light and love in your own lives. I talked with one of our matriarchs this week who has had a lot of hard things in her life recently. She said, Honey, every time something happens, 
I just learned to lean on him a little more. And he never lets me down. He's always there for me. For 80 plus years, she has been turning the gym. Another one of our members that's living with cancer and in chronic pain, every time I talk to him, he says, he's got me. He's got me and I know I'm going to be okay every time I talk to him. There is light. Even in a dark world, this summer our intergenerational mission trip is going to take adults and children as young as nine and expose them to difficult circumstances, rural and generational poverty. And we are going to enter those communities, work alongside community members, build relationships across difference. It's like the reverse of the Beverly Hillbillies. You know, it's going to be all the city folks going in to the country. But in the name of Jesus, discovering that there is light and life, resilience and hope even in the face of difficult circumstances. Where is there life and good news? Do we see much good news in the news? Well, read United Methodist News, UM News, and see what the church is doing near and far. Among the good he news headlines this week, United Methodists celebrate 100 years of mission in Nigeria with Large Street Festival. Planning committee members say the street rally became mandatory for them to celebrate life in the midst of a lot of really hard things. Mandatory for us because we cannot remain silent, proclaiming the gospel and rejoicing in the faithfulness of God throughout the years. We must let the people know that God has done a great thing thing for the United Methodist Church in Nigeria, and we are so happy to be part of that great work of love. Friends, may we go forth with the love of the women who are going to anoint Jesus' body, and may we too discover that there is life as he has told us and as he has promised, even when we expect death. May we go forth boldly proclaiming that there is life that conquers death, like a four-year-old who speaks into the grave with the confidence that the dead can rise. And may we keep turning the gem, looking for resurrection, hope, and light in the word of God, in our own lives, and in the world, no matter how dark it may seem. May we find that resurrection light and hope everywhere as he has promised.